Hi, everybody. Good evening. Thank you all for coming out. This is awesome. Um, before I start my talk, let me just thank Mr. Fortunato, Mr. Pagato. Thank you for having me. And um, if we can all just take a moment for a round of applause for uh, Michael uh, Gallant. Thank you so much for all of your efforts and the world out there. Congratulations. He really, he, I hope it's not too loud. He really was amazing, and as much as I'd love to take credit for bringing the robot here, he really was the one who made it happen, and I, I'm very thankful for that. Uh, Dr. Miller, thank you so much for including me in this uh, Society of Skeptics talk. I'm going to spend just a few minutes talking a little bit about robotic surgery, and I'm going to call on you guys a little bit and ask you to be a part of a conversation rather than me just lecturing to you. Um, for those of you who were here today, uh, you have a little bit of a taste of what the robot looks like. Um, for those of you who weren't here today, this is not the robot. Uh, I know there's a Star Wars fan in the room. Okay, good. So I didn't know that actually until after. Um, what's the difference between C3PO and the robot that we saw today? Yes. Yes, great. So that's the big difference. For those of you who didn't hear, what she said was, that the surgical robot is completely controlled by a human being. That means C-3PO is artificial intelligence, can think, can speak, can react, can have emotions. The robot doesn't do any of that in the operating room. It is simply an instrument that the surgeon uses to get the operation done more efficiently. Let me see. Great, now um, many of you, unfortunately, I'm dating myself, you probably have no idea who these people are. Is there, are there any students in the room who have any idea? Oh. Awesome, thank you so much. Who is it? Nash. Yes, terrific, very nice. Wow. That, that is impressive, that is impressive. Um, okay, so for those of you who don't know, uh, there was a very long running television series about surgeons, doctors, nurses that were in a MASH unit in the Korean War. And the reason why I put this slide up here is that the origins of robotic surgery actually was from the Department of Defense, Defense and the military. The idea was that, in principle, if a soldier got injured in, the, in, the, in wartime, a group of techs could set up the patient in an operating room and the surgeon actually did not have to leave the United States. Through remote control, they could operate the robot from Washington, D.C. and not have to be in harm's way. That all came from the use of these very large satellites, which are still up in place from NASA. They're communication satellites. And they're used not only to transmit the internet in an extremely fast way, but they're also used to take pictures of, uh, of both the United States and other countries. In fact, these uh, satellites are robots in and unto themselves. Someone can sit in a control pod in Houston and using levers and switches can make the satellite uh, make changes similarly to the surgical robot that we use now. Does anybody know what the building on the left is? Nobody knows? Wow. Faculty. Do any of the faculty know? What is it? It is not the Louvre. It is the same architect. It's, both, it's I.M. Pei. It is in the United States. This is the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Right. It's in Cleveland, Ohio. Now, does anybody know what the building on the right is? It's a pyramid. And does anybody know where that is? Excellent. Awesome. Right outside of Cairo. So why put the slides? Well, actually, I was, part of my training was at the Cleveland Clinic, which is a pretty famous hospital in Ohio. And we did operations sitting in Cleveland, Ohio, with patients in Egypt and in the United Arab Emirates by remote control. A Department of Defense satellite, like the one you see there, transmitted the internet in super high speed communications. This is in the year 2000. And we could operate on patients that were literally in the opposite side of the world sitting in Cleveland. The idea in principle was supposed to be not just for the military, but also if there was a really good surgeon, for example, in California, and someone in New Jersey wanted that surgeon to do their surgery, you could dial it in on the internet and the guy could be sitting in Cal or woman could be sitting in California and do the operation with the patient on the other side of the country. Then there was a very big event that happened in 2001 that made all of this go away very quickly. Can anybody guess what that was? 9-11, great. Why would 9-11 affect that? 
Can anyone think of a reason why the program would get shut down? Go ahead. Not a bad thought, but that's not the reason why, actually. Yes. Say that again. Not a bad thought. Also, she said the antenna on the building. That's not the reason. One last try. That is a great thought, actually. For those of you who didn't hear, he said that there was a fear of hacking the robot. We still worry about that, by the way. But that's not the reason. The reason is that as soon as 9-11 happened, all of the satellites that we were using to transmit our signals were sent over Iraq and Afghanistan to try to find Al-Qaeda. I went down to Ground Zero as a surgeon, was there only for a couple of days, and when we came back, the whole system had been shut down because the Department of Defense needed those satellites for more important things at the time. But it's important because a lot of funding for cancer, a lot of the medical advances that we make are funded by the military. So part of the geopolitics of this talk is to remind everyone that calling, declaring a war or sending soldiers to other parts of the country actually is not just about that. It affects all parts of our society, including healthcare. Now, what's cool about the robot? Why do we use it? This is the same surgeon uh, doing the operation three different ways. On the very far left is what we call a laparotomy. That's a big incision through the middle of the abdomen. It hurts. It has a longer recovery. The surgery takes longer. You're typically in the hospital for at least three or four days, if not longer. And it takes a full six to eight weeks to really get back to your job or back to life or back to sports. So somewhere around the maybe early 70s, early 80s, um, we uh, started to utilize a technique called laparoscopy. Laparoscopy is minimally invasive surgery. It's tiny little incisions, similar to robotic surgery. But the disadvantage of that is that you have to stand next to the patient. And for someone like me who will do 12 surgeries in a day, that's a very long day. You get tired. You have to wear a mask. You have to wear a gown and gloves. It can be kind of arduous and take a long time. But the advantage of minimally invasive surgery is that whereas patients were in the hospital for several days, now all of a sudden they're going home the same day and the recovery is much shorter, sometimes as short as a week or two. Now on the right, the very far right, is the Da Vinci robot. Many of you sat in it today. I will tell you off the record, you can hold on to the recording equipment. You guys are way, way, way better than any surgeons I have ever trained, ever. It is amazing what your skill set is. Uh, I wouldn't encourage you to keep playing Fortnite, but whatever you're doing, <laughs> it's working. And, uh, and you should be aware that, and I hope that many of you that maybe didn't consider being a robotic surgeon in the future will realize that you have a hidden talent and maybe you want to consider pursuing it. But you can see the surgeon on the right is not wearing a hat, not wearing a mask, not wearing gloves, can sit down. I can play Coldplay in the background. I can get a text message from my daughter from her school and stop what I'm doing in the middle of the operation and respond. It's a much, much easier day for the surgeon and the quality operation is made better largely because what I couldn't do laparoscopically before was reach into the patient and move my wrists and articulate my wrists. When you tie your shoes, you're articulating your wrists. When you're sewing in surgery, you're moving your wrists. The laparoscopic instruments that we use couldn't do that. And the robot does that unbelievably well. So suddenly big advanced radical surgeries that we could only do through big incisions, the robot made it possible for us to do that in a minimally invasive way. The robot's made out of three parts. There's a tower on the left. It's got a monitor so that everyone in the room can see what the surgeon is seeing. The only disadvantage for the folks in the room that are watching is that they don't have the 3D vision that we have when we're looking through the surgeon's console. And then most, most of you saw today, the side cart, that's what carries all the equipment and goes through the patient. Now, because we couldn't do the operations remotely, we lost our internet connections. We didn't really have the technology or the bandwidth on the internet for fear of hacking for the person who suggested that up, uh, upstairs. What ended up happening instead was that we ended up making a lot of robots and putting them in a lot of hospitals. In 2018, you'd be hard pressed to find a hospital without it. Roughly every 30 seconds, a robotic surgery starts in the world. There have been over 5 million patients that have had robotic surgery. There are 2,700 patents that go along with the, that this company owns with regards to the robot. And there's probably now, this slide's a little dated, there's probably at least 5,000 robots worldwide. Each robot costs a little bit more than $2 million. 
So if you take out a calculator, it's not a bad business for the company, but the reality is, is that even third world countries now are using robotic surgery uh, in a way that would never be dreamed of a decade ago. The reality is though, is that it took us, doctors are slow learners. We're not as bright and, and open to learning new ideas as you guys are. And even though the robot, the robot came into place around 2001 or so, uh, it took us over a decade to get to a point where more hysterectomies were being done robotically than open. The red line is open, the blue line is robotics. Now, for somebody like me who does a lot of hysterectomies, about 85% of them are robotic and the rest are open. And just like the iPhone, there's a new robot just about every few years. And just like the iPhone, when the new robot comes out, everybody wants to buy it. And with each new system that comes out, there's a new bell and whistle. So I'm going to show you a little bit in a moment about the, most, the newest version and the advantages of it. But suffice to say that with each new technology that comes out, for example, the original robot we used didn't have high definition optics. And many of you will remember that to buy a high definition television was like seven or eight thousand dollars. Now it's seven or eight hundred dollars. Those high definition optics are available now and they're in the latest version. So what's the future then? So many of you saw today that the robot has multiple arms and for each of those arms we require about a half an inch incision to pass the instruments. You still end up with tiny little scars. It's hard to get around that with a multi-arm robot. The newest robots have only one arm. We do a hysterectomy now through the base of your belly button. No one will ever know that we were there. And you go home the same day, the operation takes less than an hour. I'm going to show you just a brief video of what that new robot looks like. It's just coming out next year. One instrument passes through the patient and then the camera can look around with the surgeon's fingers. You can tie knots, you can handle needles, you can do all the things that we do surgically. I should have mentioned at the beginning, there's no gore and guts in this talk, so don't worry. Someone upstairs is a little worried about that. So this is the newest platform that's coming out, and best believe all of the hospitals are going to want it because patients are not going to want to have any scars after these types of operations. They're going to want to have a completely naive appearing belly. Uh, I am a proud Blair dad. Um, be petty, please. <laughs> We're all watching you. Uh, we, are, we are all rooting you on. Um, I am going to show you a brief video of an operation that I did just a couple of weeks ago. And I promised my daughter that if anyone is a little squeamish, there's no, nothing really bloody or horrible. Um, but before I show it, this is a moment if someone wants to look away or walk out, you're welcome to do that. Anybody want to do that? Don't feel shy or bashful. It's not a horror movie, I promise. Okay? All right. So what are you going to see? So this is a lady who has a uterine cancer. She's going to have a complete hysterectomy, and she's going to have lymph nodes sampled. The operation will take approximately 25 minutes to do. We're going to remove the uterus, cervix, tubes, and ovaries. And you're going to see a flipping of the screen between a very black image to a brighter image like this. Let me explain what that is. Uh, I don't have a pointer, but what you can see is my right hand, my left hand has instruments in it. The right hand has a device that seals arteries and then cuts between the seals. So there's no blood loss during the operation. And you can see that there's a green dye. This is the cervix, which is the lower part of the uterus, the body of the uterus, and then the tubes and ovaries on either side. The reason for the dye is that we're going to identify something called the sentinel lymph node. That means we're going to identify the lymph node that is most likely to have spread of the cancer. If there hasn't been any spread to that lymph node, then we know it's very unlikely that there's been spread to anywhere else. And as the surgeon, I'm going to flip back and forth between a laser optic that can see the dye very bright versus a regular high definition image like this. Okay, it's only seven minutes. I'm going to just sort of fly through it. So here now you see we're flipping back and forth and you can see the lymphatic channels where the dye is traveling through the lymphatic channels to the lymph nodes. Cancers in general spread to lymph nodes, so we want to take out the lymph nodes that we're most worried about. For those of you taking physics, you're going to learn about energy sources. This is an electrical device that passes an electrical current through the tissues and cauterizes as it works so there's no bleeding. I won't get too caught up in the anatomy, but what you're going to see is a very large artery on the, in the middle of the screen that goes up and down. 
That's the external iliac artery. It's the only blood supply to her leg. It would be very bad to cut that artery. But you can see that the lymph node that's sitting right on the artery glows bright green from the Firefly technology from this dye. And I'll flip back and forth as I'm operating. You see how it's bright green? I confirm that's the node, and then I'm plucking it out. And I'm embarrassed to say that many of you made this look incredibly easy today. I wish it was more complicated. All right, so now here's on the other side. We're going to, uh, now on the other side, you see the same thing, the lymphatic channels going to the sentinel lymph node. That's the ovary right there, that white thing. There's the fallopian tube kind of dangling above it. And we're going to open up the space where the lymph nodes are. How's everybody doing? Everyone's all right? I haven't heard anyone go thunk yet. That's good. <laughs> What's that? Every once in a while, uh, what did I put, the lymph node? Yeah. That great question, by the way. So you'll see later, we, I left the lymph node where I left it because I'm going to pass it out later. That's a great question. <laughs> this is some group, I got to tell you. So you can see the lymphatic channels. Again, there's the external iliac artery and vein on the left. My hand's kind of pushing against it. And you'll see this little green lymph node. That's the sentinel lymph node. I'll show you later where I put it. That's a great question. See how it glows green. This is the sigmoid colon, and you can see there's a lymph node right next to the aorta that's glowing green. That's a paraaortic lymph node. We're going to take that out. And what you'll see actually to the right of the lymph node is you'll see a white tube going up and down in the screen. That's the ureter that passes from the kidney to the bladder. That's how urine gets from your kidney, which is near your back to your bladder, which is behind your pubic bone. There's the ureter, that white thing going up and down. And you'll see the lymph node is right next to it. I'm going to lift it up. That's the aorta, that pumping vessel right there. It's best not to hurt that during the operation. So we're plucking out, ooh, ah, right. So we're plucking out that lymph node. And then all of the lymph nodes and the uterus and everything gets sent to a pathologist, and the pathologist will let us know if there were cancer cells in those lymph nodes. That's the inferior vena cava. That's a very large vein that goes through the middle of your abdomen. Also not a good thing to break while you're doing the operation. If I cut into it accidentally, then I got to stop the bleeding. If it's open, I put my finger on the bleeding. That works pretty well. But in laparoscopy and robotics, I have to sew it closed. So it just seals, and it stays sealed forever. Yep. OK, so now we're going to do the hysterectomy. You're going to see this instrument that comes through the tissues. It basically seals on both sides, and then the scalpel goes through the middle of it. Yes. How many different attachments are, are available for you? I mean, this is very different How many different attach? Oh, how many instruments are there? Right. So we've consolidated. There's there's a menu of roughly 20 different instruments, but we try very hard because every time we use them, it costs money. So I'm limited. I only use three during the operation. Now you see it's a little smoky and then the smoke clears. That's because the electricity creates heat, which causes, makes steam, and then that smoke goes away. This is the uterine artery. It's the main blood supply. This is the bladder. We're going to take the bladder down. Don't look, Abby. <laughs> we have to take the bladder down as part of the hysterectomy. There's about a minute left. Maybe two. What's that? Because the steam gets up against the camera lens. You see then we clean the camera and then all of a sudden it's more clear. Now remember that the uterus is at the top of the vagina so we're going to cut through the vagina. I have a, a blue device in the vagina so we're cutting on that. And that's how we separate it from the patient. 
How's everybody doing? Everyone's still here. That blue device is a plastic device that's inside the, the patient that allows me to know where to cut. We put that in before we start. Uh, <laughs> lots of oohs and ahs. Abby's giving me the this sign up there. <laughs> you guys will make it through this. We're almost done. Mr. Priyano. How many of these surgeries would you do in a day? So uh, that's a great question. I've done about 7,500 of them roughly, and I would say on an average day, it's around 10 or 11 hysterectomies a day. Three operating rooms, so I don't have to be there for the cleaning. So now we pull it out through the vagina, right? And then, and then an assistant puts a bag in. We put the, that's where the lymph nodes go. The lymph nodes go in the bag, right? Almost done, you're doing great, guys. <laughs> You'll never forget the skeptics, I promise. <laughs> and then with the robot, this is kind of the miracle of the robot, we just we sew it closed. And those stitches absorb, you don't have to take them out. They're there for a few months and then they absorb and go away. Mr. Fortunato. Does insurance cover it is the question? Oh, great question. So the insurance companies will not compensate the hospital more for using the robot. Um, but the advantage of the robot is that if you do traditional laparoscopy, it could take an hour or two to do the surgery, whereas robotically we're much faster. And it costs us about $71 a minute in the operating room with labor and, and everything that goes into it. So an hour all of a sudden is an enormous savings for us. The other frustration is that because so many patients go home the same day, the hospital no longer gets compensated for an inpatient stay. It's an ambulatory procedure. And that affects the economics. But we still, we want to do the right thing by the patient and the, the economics of it becomes sort of a secondary endpoint. Yes. All right, cool. All right, time for questions. No, the greens that die that will be absorbed over time and will go away on its own. The thing that's weird, it's a great question. It's cleared through your urine, so the patient for the next couple of days will pee green. But then it eventually clears and it goes away. The dye was injected to try to identify the sentinel nodes. That's why they glowed so brightly, because the dye was absorbed and then traveled to the lymph nodes that are most at risk. Great. Upstairs. Can you stand up so I can hear you behind the glass? I'm sorry. How long would it take someone to recover from that? So you're typically in the, in the recovery room for about an hour and a half. You go home from the recovery room. You're up and walking the next day. You can go up and down stairs. You can eat and drink whatever you want. We don't let you drive a car for a week, and we don't let you do any heavy lifting for six weeks. We give everybody six weeks off from work. Most people are back in two weeks. They don't ever, the overwhelming majority of people don't need to take painkillers. They just take Tylenol and Motrin and something like that. It's a good question. Thank you for that. Other questions? Oh, wait, sorry. One at a time. First in the back. How these devices change how the trained? So that's a great question. It's, got, uh, it's gotten, so the question, in case you didn't hear, is how has it changed how surgeons are trained, right? That's your question, right? So that's great. So when the robots first came out, we had to teach older surgeons how to become robotic surgeons. That was really hard. Um, we're not, we don't have nearly as good of hand-eye coordination as you guys do, and we're not used to um, 3D imaging and that sort of stuff. And even the technology of turning it on is complicated. It's hard enough for me to figure out my MacBook. Um, but now new doctors are all trained starting in medical school on the robot. The way that works is we have two consoles. I'm sitting at one, they're sitting at the other one. We let them do the operation in fact, this operation I did for the video, but normally it would be someone in training doing it. But I'm, I have my hands in the, in the console while they're working, and if they make a mistake, I can, if I just touch the device, their hands freeze and I take over control. So for those of you who haven't done driver's ed yet, it's kind of like that where someone's sitting next to you, they can slam on the brakes if you're going to drive off the road. It's kind of the same thing here. So that's a long answer to your question, but the, but the reality is, is that 
almost all new surgical residents, regardless of what discipline they're in, are getting trained in the robot so they're ready to go by the time they finish their training. Did you have a question here? What are some obstacles for us to uh, apply artificial intelligence and perform a completely robot operated like, operation? So these questions are awesome. You know what's amazing is um, uh, I give these lectures to surgeons and I give these lectures to residents and I give these lectures to medical students. And you guys have way smarter questions than any of them do. Really kudos to you. So the question, in case you didn't hear it, is how far are we from the robot actually doing the operation, not just the surgeon controlling it? Uh, many of you may or may not know that when you fly on a jumbo jet, the pilot actually never touches the controls of the airplane. He flies it to the end of the runway. He pushes a button. The plane takes off, flies the flight, and lands itself. And then at the end of the runway, the pilot turns off the autopilot and taxis it to the gate. And if you asked a pilot 15 years ago, what's the chance that a computer is going to do the whole flight all by themselves? They would say, I'm sure there's no way that that's ever going to happen. I think we're probably about 15, 20 years away. I think what you'll see over time is that we'll learn that the robot can actually do the operation better than we can. And the real purpose of us being there is just in case the robot breaks down or doesn't work, that we can be there from a safety standpoint for the patient. But everything in medicine, like you see, even when the robot came out, it took almost 10 years before we really started to use it properly. And there is no platform right now that, can, that has artificial intelligence, although there's really been one company in the world, Intuitive Surgical, that's, that's been creating these devices. And Google and Johnson & Johnson just signed an agreement to develop their own surgical robot. And I'd be shocked if it doesn't include a component of artificial intelligence as part of the platform. It's a good question. Yes? Another great question. So the question was, does this robot, uh, can this robot do all sorts of types of operations or is it just for a certain spot? So right now, this device is used mostly for abdominal and pelvic surgery. It's used for open heart surgery. It's used for lung surgery. It's used for some uh, ear, nose, and throat operations. Uh, Northwell Health, what I'm a part of just last week, did the first robotic breast cancer operation. The only place where the Da Vinci robot really uh, has a competitor that, that is not used is for brain and spinal cord. There are other robotic companies that have sort of captured that market. And the use of the robot right now for, I, I noticed there are a couple of students who have had sports injuries. The use of the robot for orthopedic surgery is still kind of in its infancy. It's not really there yet. It's a good question. Yes? So we only did those cases back in 2000. It's also a really good question. Um, there's so many robots now locally at, at, at each campus, at each hospital, that remote surgery has not really taken off at all. Uh, when 9-11 happened and, and that opportunity sort of set sail, if you will, uh, it forced hospitals to get their own platforms and that's why there are so many around the world. Um, what we're seeing though is that the training to become a robotic surgeon takes so long that there'll probably be fewer and fewer robotic surgeons nationally and there may be simply out of demand a need for one surgeon to be able to operate over large geographical areas. But as of today, it's not known that people are doing it over an internet connection the way it was initially intended. Yes? Wow, that's a really good question and a really long answer. Um, but I would say with regard, in, in all fields, cancer and the medicines that we're using, um, the use of stem cell transplants, the, there's so many amazing things happening at once. You know, when the Human Genome Project was completed during the Clinton era, it really opened up a whole world of science. You know, I, I was sitting last year in Parents Weekend, I went to a bi a honors biology class here, you guys were learning about enzymes and optimal pH and optimal temperature. You have no idea how relevant that is to what I do every day. Um, and I would just, I tried to make this plea to the classes that were there. 
it is amazing. I wish I could do high school all over again is the truth. Because honestly, the stuff that you're learning here now is so incredibly relevant to what we do every day. Um, and some of those advances, to answer your question, come out of that. Like the robotics lab that's here. Something's going to come out of that lab that all of a sudden is going to go viral and it'll affect all of healthcare. Um, and I'm absolutely certain of that. Um, so between high definition optics and fiber optics and wireless and Bluetooth and all the stuff that you guys are sort of used to using every day, medicine will continue to advance very rapidly. And the world is a smaller place too, you know, what they do. We know when they do something new in England, we know immediately. Um, I'm, I review a lot of videos for quality of surgeons that operate all over the world. We watch their videos like this and we critique them. I see things happening in India that are amazing that we would never have thought of to do here and we're learning from all over the world how to do those procedures. Yes? So there are, the width of the trocar is eight millimeters, so a little bit more than half an inch, and that's about the width of the instruments that we're using. You end up with tiny little incisions. Sometimes you can hardly tell if the patient had surgery before. Yes? Uh, what mechanisms give the robot its precision? I'm sorry, I asked the question again. Uh, what mechanisms give the robot its precision? Well, I wish I was a mechanical engineer. That sounds like a robot person asking me a question that's way over my head. Um, I will say this, though. Um, because it's a digital signal from the solenoids that are taking the input and then transmitting that to the robot. Um, for example, if you're a surgeon and you have a really shaky hand, you can set a setting on the robot that will, if my hand goes like this, the robot will do this. And so some of that te solenoid technology and dampening and the fact that it's all ones and zeros and digital messages allows us to affect the quality of the surgeon. Uh, the one shortcoming of the machine, I think, is that it doesn't yet tell us what we're feeling. We don't get a tactile sense back from it yet. That's the next generation of robots, will be that the data will be going in both directions rather than us just telling the robot what to do. Up top, hi. Right, so that's a good question. So uh, is there ever an instance where an open procedure is better than a robotic procedure? We're about to have an oh my god moment. Are you ready? You ready? So the largest ovarian tumor I ever took out was 174 pounds. That's big. That's more than probably most of you. That requires a wheelbarrow. You can't take that out through tiny little incisions. The patient came into the hospital weighing 310 pounds and she left weighing 140 pounds. So there are certain situations, very big tumors that you just can't get them out through tiny holes. Right. Yes. Okay, so if I understand your question, because I'm not near the patient, right, is it ever difficult to remind myself of the orientation of how the camera is? Do I ever get lost is sort of the question. Yeah, that in fact actually very rarely happens. The only time when that happens is if you've had a lot of prior surgeries or if you've had radiation or other types of treatments, you can get a lot of scar tissue where things are kind of glued together and it's hard to tell what's what. But it doesn't really happen often. There is a little sensor on here. I don't know if you can see it. You see all the way at the top, there's a little camera that's kind of tilted clockwise a little bit. So that's constantly reminding the surgeon what the orientation of the camera is compared to the horizontal. Because there are sometimes actually where you tend to get a little tilted like this and you forget that you're that way. And the, and the visual cue of, the, of, that low, of that icon reminds you to come back to center, right? Yes. Yeah, so that's uh, a question that almost every patient asks, right? Because they want to know, are they really going to go home the same day or are they going to end up with a big incision? So you can never promise anyone that's having any kind of abdominal surgery that they won't end up with a big incision. But I can tell you, as somebody who does hundreds a year, the last time I had to open someone was about four or five years ago. It's very rare, um, but it can happen for sure. 
So the, uh, that's also a great question. So most, it's amazing. So most complications we can fix robotically. So the reason why we tend to open patients is if it looks like it's gonna be really complicated, we open because we think doing it open will be safer. So we don't open patients typically for a complication, we open patients to avoid the complication. Because there are certain limitations to working like this, right? That if I can get my hands in and I can get more exposure and more space, I can, sometimes it's safer and I think it's better for the patient. So one of the students asked today, I thought was a really, really uh, valid question. Actually, to be a really great robotic surgeon or to be a really great surgeon in general has less to do with what cool things you can do with the device. It has more to do with talking to the patient and examining the patient and deciding if they're a good candidate for robotic surgery. So the main reason why we don't open a lot of patients is because the patients that we think aren't good candidates, we would not have taken with the robot in the first place. Does that make sense? Yes. Yes. Dude, that is an awesome question. <laughs> what is going on here today? You know what, we should, if, if this is being recorded, can I please bring this back to the medical school and embarrass all of them? Because this is amazing. Well, that is such a great question. So these devices were approved only in human beings. But there are minimally invasive surgeries that can be done on animals, depending upon how big the animal is. Um, I had to do, this is such a great story, it's a quick anecdote, and if I'm running out of time, can you please just wave at me and say stop? So I had a patient once that weighed 675 pounds, and the problem with that was that she was too heavy for the operating room table. So where would we operate on her? If we can't operate on her at the hospital because we don't have a table that's big enough, where do you think we did her surgery? Where? No, not, not a bad guess, but no, we, it's a sterile operation. Where? At the zoo. Because they do laparoscopic surgery on gorillas and elephants and tigers and all that stuff. And you know what's a really, uh, a really kind of a really quick anecdote, you'll get a kick out of this, is that when you operate on human beings, the anesthesiologist is in the room with you. But when you operate on uh, in the, the zoo, the anesthesiologist is behind a glass wall because when the animal wakes up, nobody wants to be in the room with the animal when it wakes up. So they're completely outside of the room doing it through glass. It takes a little getting used to. That was a very good question. So they do have robots and instruments for animals, but not this one. All right, good. Any other questions? Yes. Was there ever a time where I objected to the idea of robotic surgery? Full disclosure, absolutely yes. I was really fast at doing these operations laparoscopically. The equipment was really expensive. I thought the setup was gonna take forever and I thought it was gonna slow me down. It took me a few years to start to see the value of doing it this way. And I think most doctors and lawyers and architects and others get into sort of a pattern that they know works for them and to get them to change can sometimes take time and I was certainly one of those people yes other questions yes is the, is the goal of robotic surgery that there would be no part of the body that could be deemed too dangerous to operate in or inoperable so the question is is there is part of the rationale for robotic surgery that there are parts of the body that previously would have been considered too dangerous to work on and now all of a sudden are, it's easier? Uh, I think the short answer is probably no. I think, you know, if you, if you can't, the, 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 the robot's basically a, fa a fancy way of doing the operation that we could do open or laparoscopic. It doesn't suddenly make exposure or anything so much better that the risks would be justified, right? Yes. What is going on here tonight? Yeah, they got stockholders and shareholders and everything. I mean, I, I, listen, there's an, there's an enormous benefit to this technology. Uh, could there be some motivations by private companies to do what's perhaps more business sound and maybe better for the better good? Sure, they could give the robots away. That would be good for everybody, but they don't. 
I'm, I don't think it's as, as conspiracy theory as they do things that would be bad for people because they make more money doing that. I don't think it's that. But are there strategies and markets and, 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 and calculations that are made before rolling out new technologies? Same thing with pharmaceutical companies and others? Absolutely yes, I would say. Yeah. Dr. Miller. Well, so it's interesting what's kind of, the question is have insurance rates gone down? I think what you mean are, because I don't think there's anyone in the room that thinks that their insurance premiums have dropped ever, right? If, if it has, then their deductibles went up by a lot, something like that, right? Um, I think what's sort of happening internationally is there's been a tremendous shift of risk towards inst healthcare providers away from the insurers. And this technology has allowed them to pay less for the same operation because the cost is a lot less. Whether or not that parlays to lower premiums, I doubt it. But it certainly would be a rationale for lowering premiums. If anyone was actually looking for those rationales, it probably wouldn't be a bad thing. Yeah. Yes? So the question was, is there ever an issue with sterility with these instruments? And we treat these instruments the same way we treat any surgical instrument. They go through a, a very, very complicated sterilization process. And then the nurses in the operating room are tasked with checking and double checking and triple checking. Uh, I'm gonna knock on something. I haven't had a single infection related to a robotic surgery having done thousands of them. But certainly hysterectomies in general because you're cutting through spaces that are not sterile there's probably about a half a percent risk of infection in general. It just hasn't been my anecdotal experience. Yeah. Anything else? Yes? Do you think there'll ever be a time where surgeons are only trained robotically? I don't. The question was, will there ever be a time where surgeons are only trained robotically? I, I, I don't think it'll be that there will never, I don't think, I think your question is kind of, Will there ever be a time where everything can be done with the robot so you don't need to know how to do anything else? And I think the answer to that question is definitely no. But is it possible that some surgeons will only do robotics? And if you need a robotic surgery, you have to go to that specific person because they don't do anything else. And other people don't do robotics. That's already kind of happening. And I do think that is part of the future for sure. Yeah. Okay. Yes. I have one of those magic eight ball things. <laughs> and if it says my sources say no, then it's a bad idea for sure. Um, that's, that is really why it takes so many years of training to be qualified to get privileges to do these operations. It, takes, it is a multifactorial thing. It partly has to do with the health of the patient and what her prior, or his prior surgical history is. It partly has to do with the size of the thing we have to take out. It partly has to do with um, some of the logistics that go along with, for example, we use in, in the chemistry class today, we talked about the fact that we use carbon dioxide to blow up the abdomen. And for example, someone who's a very heavy smoker, they retain a lot of carbon dioxide as a baseline. And so they tend to be harder patients to operate on because of their other health issues. So there's kind of a lot that goes into those decisions. Um, but after a while, I think, you know, like any other industry, you kind of get sort of this feeling, this is a good one or this is a bad one, and you sort of trust those instincts to lead you. Yeah. Mr. Picado. I'm in this room and I want to do this kind of work. Yes. Um, what, are, what is your advice uh, based on your experience training doctors, working yes. with, uh, you know, med students, just in your general experience? That's a great question. So the first advice I have for anyone who thinks that they might want to be a doctor if you're not in a family of doctors, I would suggest you call me and come and spend some time in the operating room with me. We have high school students there all the time. You're more than welcome to come. I think you know watching a video for seven minutes is probably not a life-changing event. Um, I think it's really, really important. This is maybe a, a bit of a standing on a soapbox moment, but I think it is really, really important to remember that if you're gonna be a physician, you're gonna be doing science for a, a lot of your life. I was a government major in college. I think having a well-rounded education and not being solely about biology all the time 
is really, really important because doctors have to be worldly. They have to know what's going on in the world. They have to be able to relate to patients. They have to be well-rounded, normal people. And I would just caution you that um, if you spend too much of your time at this point in your career focused on, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a doctor, I want to be a doctor, you'll miss the relevance of the other things like the arts and government and uh, history and language that are so vitally important. For example, I'll share with you something. I'm a little embarrassed. I got a D in Spanish in high school. That was a disaster because you can't be a doctor in New York and not speak Spanish. So actually when I was in college, I went to live in Spain for six months because I was, I didn't take Spanish seriously when I was in high school and it was, uh, I think, a tragic mistake. So that's a long-winded answer to your question. I will also tell you this though, I think it's really important to, um, to be a good student because medical school is competitive. When you go to college, it's important to have good grades. And the one mistake that I think some people make uh, when, they want, when they know at a younger age that they want to be a physician is they feel like they have to do the chemistry and the bio and the organic chemistry and all that stuff very early in their college career. And they end up in a situation where they're with seniors and juniors where it might be easier for them and it's competitive and more difficult. I would suggest that when you go to college, maybe your educators won't agree with me, that you start off taking the basics and get a good GPA in the beginning, get adjusted. You guys will have an unfair advantage because this is as close to a college environment as I think anyone can experience in high school. But there will still be an adjustment and I think it's really important to get good grades and get settled in before you start tackling organic chemistry or some of the courses that are known to be killers and absolutely necessary to get into medical school. And the one last thing I would say is there, there's sometimes a temptation I think to enroll in programs that uh, shorten your undergraduate years as a combined undergraduate medical school thing. You know, in Europe, the way it works is when you finish high school, you have to pick your career trajectory. And you go right from high school to medical school or to law school or whatever. And there are some real advantages to that because you get done faster, but I think you miss out on the advantage of your undergraduate education and all the other things it has to offer you. And I would discourage people from trying to take that shorter track. I don't think that year in the big picture means a lot. And by the way, I, I know this is kind of a hot topic lately, but I think a gap year is a great thing. I just think, um, I'm not so sure about right after high school, I think a lot of people do it between college and medical school before they go to graduate school to kind of enjoy life and see the world a bit before they get into graduate school which tends to be really hard in a lot of hours. All right, great. Hey, thank you all for coming, those were great questions, thank you. Thank you so much.